know if it is working correctly or not. Anyway, we have to start. So any any anybody can can hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So good afternoon, uh, or good evening, or good morning, depending on the time zone. And welcome to the 12th session of the ISRM Young Member Seminars series. I'm uh, Dr. Ignacio Perez Rey uh, from the University of Vigo in Spain, currently in Sweden. And um, today I have with me my colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Federico Bagnon from the Politecnico di Torino and Philip Brown from the Col uh, de Pont de Paris. And well, as part of the ISRM Young Members uh, Group, uh, we are happy to chair this, uh, this talk seminar. It's a great pleasure for us to be here today. And we would like to thank you for attending this session. And before starting, I'd like to, well, to thank the support uh, received from the International Society for Rock Mechanics and Rock Engineering, and especially to Dr. Sevda de Koga, who is the ISRM Vice President for Australasia and Chair of this uh, committee of this uh, Young Members Committee. We would also like to thank all the Young Member representatives from uh, other countries like uh, Italy, France, Canada, Japan, China, Chile, and so on. And finally, uh, but not less importantly, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Batista Taboni, uh, Dr. Jose Gregorio Gutierrez Chacon and Dr. Uh, Lucille Carrile uh, for agreeing to present their work in this session. But first, I'd like to explain or try to explain in a brief uh, manner what are these ISRM Young Member Seminars. Uh, uh, well, the, the project, uh, this project uh, attempts to promote the uh, community interested in rock mechanics, including engineers, research scientists, and students to foster knowledge uh, in rock mechanics among this community and to share experience both in the industry and the academia and to strengthen relations between different countries. Uh, we would like to, to invite um, any interested uh, young uh, researchers to participate in this seminar series, uh, but uh, well, they, they have to fulfill uh, certain criteria uh, to be selected as speakers. First, uh, be, uh, being an ISRM member, having a maximum age of 35 years or 40 years if the PhD degree was obtained in the previous five years, or have worked in rock mechanics and rock engineering for a period no longer than 10 years. The nominations, how to apply to this, um, to participate in these seminars, uh, they have to be uh, nominated by the national group or by some other person or organization acquainted with this nominee's work, uh, but uh, the self nominations are also accepted. And for more information and nominating someone or yourself, if you are one of them, uh, just contact the YMS, the Young Member Seminars Organizing Committee at the um, account shown on the screen. Now it's time to present our first speaker. And I think uh, my colleague Federico Bagnon uh, will uh, tell something about him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker of this uh, seminar, uh, that is uh, Battista Taboni, who is a PhD student at the University of Torino, Italy, where he obtained a degree in applied geology. He specializes in slope stability, rock mass characterization through contact and non-contact methods, site investigation and modeling. And the focus of the current research is the assessment of rock fall phenomena from the description and the quantification of the key future of the source rock mass to identification and quantification of the parameter required for a proper protection work design, particularly by means of uh, probabilistic methods. Today, he will present a talk entitled Block Volume and Shape and Their Role in Rock Fall Problems. Uh, Battista, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Federico. 
Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay. So good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure and an honor to be the first speaker of today. So I would like to thank you, the organizers of this seminar, for inviting me. Uh, today I will speak about block volume and shape and their role in uh, rock for problems. So a brief overview of the, what I will be talking about uh, this afternoon. Uh, at the beginning, I will introduce briefly the design approach for uh, rock for mitigation techniques and describe how we can assess block volume. We will then jump to numerical simulation and specifically source area identification and block shape assessment, and then uh, conclude with some uh, conclusions and then describe some still open questions. So first of all, the standard procedure for designing uh, rock for mitigation structures or works is called energy-based design approach because energy is the main key features involved in the design approach. As we can see here in this slide on the right side, uh, this is linked to the fact that different energy levels involved in the process require different techniques and structures to manage, manage them. By energy, in this context, I mean the total kinetic energy of the uh, falling block, which is a function of the mass and the speed or velocity of the falling block, and therefore is a function of uh, density, volume, and speed. So volume is the true key parameter. The problem here is the fact that there is no specific indication on how to select this volume. The most common practice involves uh, uh, the um, designer to get some values for the block size, average them, and then use this average value without asking uh, himself if uh, the use of an average value has any kind of sense. In general, there are three ways to get to measure uh, the size of blocks. The first one is to use and to measure already fallen block at the toe of a scarp, for example, or use data already recorded in landslide inventory, inventories. Uh, or you can measure the size of potentially unstable blocks directly on the rock face. Or again, you can measure the scars left on the rock face after a block, an unstable block has fallen. The last approach consists in the determination and uh, of the geometrical features of the rock mass itself, and then use those geometrical features to calculate the block size. And today we will focus on this third approach. So the first step consists in the identification of the geometrical properties of the rock mass, which are joint orientation and spacing. We heavily rely on non-contact methods for mostly because they avoid a uh, kind of logistical issue that traditional contact, contact methods have, which is the fact that in most cases, in most instances, it's extremely difficult to have access to the entirety of the rock face. So if you only measure those geometrical properties at the toe of the scarp, which is usually the most accessible uh, position along the rock face, you are missing out on a lot of information. While if you use non-contact methods, for example, laser scanning or photogrammetry, both uh, land-based or UAV-based, you can get um, a complete cover of the rock face, uh, constructing a digital model and then extracting from this digital model the geometrical features. So once uh, you get the geometrical feature of the rock mass, you are supposed to plug these values uh, of orientation and spacing into some uh, equations that will get you the volume or block size. The most commonly used equation of this type is the one proposed by Palmstrom in 1996. But it's now in 2023, there is a new formulation available proposed by Umili et al. Uh, as we can see in this slide, both of these formulas look quite similar. We always have the product of spacings at the top, so the numerator of the fraction. And then we have the um, a sort of shape factor accounting for the orientation of the joint sets at the, numerator, at the denominator. In the case of the new formula, the shape factor is called Q and it's calculated as we see here on the left. Q is a function of two angles, gamma, which is the angle between two of the joint sets and delta, which is the angle between the intersection of those two joint sets and the normal direction to the third joint set. Uh, Q is quite complex to visualize and to understand 
because it's um, in, theoretically it's uh, a function of six variable deep and deep direction uh, of each of the three joint sets. So it's very difficult to visualize it, but we can kind of doing it if we constrain heavily the variability of this value, as we can see here on the diagram on the left, where we have two of the joint sets, which are always fixed at orthogonal uh, with respect to each other, and we vary the deep and deep direction of the third set. Uh, one of the advantages of the original Palmstrom formula is the fact that you have to measure three angles, gamma, which are the angles between each couple of the three joint sets, uh, which is quite easy to do graphically. It turns out that it's also quite easy, extremely easy to cal calculate, measure the angles gamma and delta for the new formula, as we can see here uh, in this slide. In fact, uh, gamma is, as I said, the um, angle between two of the joint sets, in this case, K3 and K2, while delta is the angle between the intersection of these two joint sets and the pole uh, of the third uh, joint set, which by definition is the direction normal to the joint set. So this formula, it's quite simple to apply. Uh, and if you get all the values, you can plug them in into the equation and you get one single volume value. Now the question is, does a single value uh, describe completely accurately the real natural variability of such a feature within natural material such, for example, a rock mass? And the answer is, in most cases, no. Luckily, we can substitute the single values within these equations. It works for both of them. Uh, you substitute these single values with the corresponding frequency distribution. In this case, what you get is not a single volume value, but it's a frequency distribution uh, of the volume, which is called in situ block size distribution. This is how an in-situ block size distribution looks like, IBSD for short, and it's, it works practically, and for all intents and purposes, it works just like a grain distribution, so, uh, which is familiar for those of you who work with soil and soil geotechnics. Uh, a curve of this kind is supposed to work in two ways. You can either choose a reference volume value and then quantify the, the corresponding uh, probability or frequency or probability of not being exceeded, or vice versa, you can set a level of probability of not being exceeded and quantify the corresponding volume of value. If we assume that the spacing uh, of a joint set is a continuous random variable and that two of these uh, distributions are absolutely independent from, one each, from each other and that the effect of the orientation of these sets is negligible, then it can be shown that from this formulation here, we can derive the two formulas that we see on the right side of the slide, which correspond to, defini <clears throat> to a definition of the expected volume value, which is uh, a sort of average value and the variance of the volume, which is a descriptor of how variable the volume is. And both of these values are directly linked to the corresponding average and variance of the three joint set uh, spacings distributions. This is the effect that uh, I've just described. So we can see here that for an increasing value of uh, the spacing um, variance, we have an increased value of the variance of the volume with respect to the average value for the spacing. In general, it should be noted that the frequency corresponding to the expected value is not equal to 50% in general. So, okay, now we have a powerful tool to describe the natural variability in terms of probability of not being exceeded of the volume within a rock mass. How can we use it? The, mm, uh, the approach that we propose, it's called design scenario. A design scenario is nothing more than the partition of an EBSD curve into sectors. Each sector is associated with a specific uh, management technique or structure, defensive structure. Uh, each sector, as we can see in this slide, is defined by an upper limit, which is the uh, highest volume value that that given technique can manage. So, for example, for the low volumes, we can manage them using active countermeasures, for example, draper and wire meshes, which can manage only a limited value, V, 
which corresponds to a given probability of not being exceeded P or F1. Of course, as I've stated before, uh, you can also work uh, on vice versa. So you can identify a priori uh, volume value and then check within the design scenario uh, how much of the uh, EBSD you are actually managing with that selected volume. So, okay, we have spoken about uh, uh, block size, but the true key parameter I stated at the beginning of the presentation is energy. So we still have to compute this total kinetic energy. To do so, the most easy and most used approach is to perform some numerical simulation. There exists 2D and 3D numerical simulation based on different approaches to the mechanical description of the rockfall, which the most commonly used are lumped mass and rigid body. In general, it can be said that you always need uh, these five input uh, data. So first of all, you need the source area. Then you need a description of the block size, of the block density, block shape in case you are working with rigid body techniques, and lastly, a slope model. So we have described how to get the block size distribution. Now we will speak about uh, source area and block shape. Rock density usually is assumed as a, a constant value and slope model is expected to be uh, derived from a survey of the um, considered study case, for example. So source area identification. Uh, the most common approach is to map the entire surface of a rock face and then consider each point of that area as a potential source, which is fine, is conservative. So we ask, we asked ourselves if there was a way of doing such a procedure in a more precise and accurate way. And we found that you can do it if you borrow a concept from rock mass stability analysis. When you perform rock mass stability analysis, the first step is always to identify uh, if uh, any kind of movement within the rock mass is geometrically possible. And this is done using kinematic analysis. Uh, which relies on the uh, geometrical features of the uh, rock mass, the joint sets specifically, of the front or rock face you're studying, and some simple geometrical rules. The question was, can we map each point where at least one test is positive on a rock face? Because if one the test is positive, it means that at least one movement is possible, which in return means that that point is uh, an effective is effectively a, a potential source position. And to do so, we devised an algorithm, we call it AMTT, which stands for Alg Automatic Markland Test Tool, uh, which does just that. It uses a DSM, so a digital model of the surface of the rock face to uh, compute the kinematic tests. And among other results, it yields a map of the source areas, which can be used for mostly for 3D rockfall simulation, but it, you can also, of course, use it simplifying it in a uh, 2D software. Okay, we have uh, described how to get the source areas. Now we have to describe block shape. So um, computing these uh, three color spacing CDF, so cumulative uh, uh, density functions, uh, Le, the orange, yellow, and red ones compute the blue IBSD. Even the fact that their average value is quite different, we expected the shape to be a prism-like block. Uh, all the joint sets are assumed to be orthogonal to each other for simplicity's sake. Then we, got, we selected another uh, CDF, the black one. We used it three times to calculate this red uh, EBSD, which as you can see is extremely similar to the blue one. But considering the fact that we are using always three times the same CDF for the spacing, we expected the shape to be cubic, equidimensional. So we needed a way of classifying each point on this curve so that uh, we could identify for each point a uh, shape. And we chose to use the classification provided by Palmstrom in 2001, which uses these simple assumptions and provide the possibility of um, creating these diagrams. From these diagrams, we can see two things. First and foremost, that uh, for a given EBSD, it is possible to identify a shape distribution, which is represented by these pie charts. And uh, therefore it can be used. The simplest way of using such a distribution would be to justify 
the choice of a reference shape. So for example, for the red uh, cubic, a cubic expected uh, block, we see that 77% of the blocks are actually equidimensional. So one could say, okay, I choose to, to uh, simulate using numerical, simu uh, numerical simulations only the equidimensional shape because 77%, so three quarters of the blocks are uh, actually equidimensional. But this is not really a choice, a reasonable choice in the case of the second distribution where we can see that there is no actual polarization to work one of the four possible uh, classes of shape. In this case, the most reasonable thing to do would be to uh, perform four numerical simulations to weight the results using the relative abundances of these, oops, of these um, shapes and then to sum them up together so that you are actually computing the entirety of the shape distribution. The second feature that we can get from this distribution is that even in the case when you uh, use a synthetic example such as this one where we use the uh, same precise um, uh, spacing CDF to compute the, uh, the equidimensional uh, block EBSD, we see that, okay, most of the time the block is actually equidimensional, but almost a quarter of the blocks are not actually equidimensional. So what we get from this slide is that to assess the uh, if, um, real distribution of the shapes is quite important because otherwise you could miss this kind of information. Uh, this slide is simply here to visualize the effect of um, this, the shape of a uh, rock fall of, of, of the block in a rock fall event. Um, consider that of these five simulations, the only variable, so the only parameter which is not constant is the shape itself. For instance, the volume is always five cubic meter. And we see, for example, that between the, re, uh, the green uh, simulator run out uh, of the cubic block here on the left and the red one, which is the slab-like block, uh, the difference is huge. So the take, a, take home message is do compute the block shape. Of course, only if you're working with rigid body softwares, because if you're working with lumped mass software, you cannot do, uh, you cannot do it because you cannot compute the shape. So in conclusion, Considering the energy-based design approach, we introduced a re, uh, reliable, easily repeatable and precise description of block size using the EBSD approach. We introduced an easily repeatable and precise identification of the source area using the EMT algorithm. And lastly, we introduced a reliable, easily repeatable and precise description of the block shape using the block shape distribution approach that I've just presented which means that uh, we significantly, uh, we try to significantly improve the data management, which is required for the uh, type of design approach that I've in, uh, hinted at in this presentation. The improvement is in terms of reliability, accuracy, precision, and repeatability, but also in terms of accountability. For accountability, I mean that, for example, a practitioner who is expected to choose and to justify the choice of uh, for example, the block size to be used in the design approach or the shape uh, to be used in the design uh, of the protection techniques in, with our methodology, the, the uh, practitioner or the designer can justify in terms of quantities, so quantitatively justify the choices that he or she makes. So uh, some open questions. The first open question is this fact here. So while studying the shape distributions that I've just presented a few slides, few slides ago, we noted that if you plot uh, on the same diagram that we have just seen previously, uh, if, you also, if you also plot the volume size, uh, what you get is a distribution of this kind. So the question, as we can see here, is why does uh, the shape change as a function of uh, the volume in terms of the fact that the higher the volume, the higher the likelihood of having a regular equidimensional shape. We don't know why, it's still an open question. We don't know which factors are involved in this fact, and we don't know which type of consequences it could have, for example, on the design approach. The second problem is this semi-probabilistic versus full probabilistic approach. So what we just, what I just presented is the fact that you use uh, the EBSD to justify quantitatively the choice of a selected 
the selection of a deterministic single volume value to be used as an inductive for numerical simulation, which means that this approach is technically semi-probabilistic because you use the probabilistic procedure only to quantitatively justify the choice of a single value. The true question is, can we use uh, the entire EBSD as an input? Uh, in this case, do we have to account for the size shape correlation that I've just shown you? Uh, and lastly, how do we manage the uh, type of output that such a simulation would produce? Do we have to change the design approach or can we still use the traditional energy-based one? And the last open question is fragmentation. Fragmentation is a significant problem. It's because it directly influences the EBSD. Here on the left side of the slide, we can see a simplified, very simplified uh, scheme representing a sort of point of view of what the fragmentation does in terms of EBSD. The problem with fragmentation it is that practically it's never accounted for. So the true question is, is it possible to quantify it in terms of an EBSD? Is it possible to implement it into our design approach? And with this last open question, I thank you for your attention. I finished my presentation. I want to thank you also on behalf of my entire research group. So thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Battista, for this very interesting presentation. We are perfectly in time, so now we have time for, we have 10 minutes for question and answer uh, session. So if anyone has uh, any question, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, there is a question from Phil. Yes, I want to ask on the last part of about the fragmentation because you showed there's a shift of the distribution curve. Is it always like this, or does it depend also on the? No, in practice, it's never phenomenon. like that because that is an extreme oversimplification of what a fragmentation would do to an actual EBSD. So what you should expect to happen is that you have a higher likelihood for fragmentation to happen for larger blocks. Uh, because of a lot of reasons, geometrical properties of the mass, uh, the larger the block, the higher the energy associated with it, the free fall phase of the rock fall, so the higher the likelihood that it will break. So in reality, the, the, a more realistic as, um, look of what it would happen would be that the higher portion of the EBSD, which describes the uh, largest volumes would uh, have a larger shift toward the left. The shift mm. has always to be towards the left because the left side of the EBSD is the side of the smaller blocks. So you have to expect some kind of fan of um, where you, it, which is, shows you that smaller blocks do tend to fragment it, but with less likelihood than larger blocks. Mm. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, one question I want to ask. Mm -hmm. As uh, we do photogrammetry of a slope structure, mm -hmm. sim, uh, drone monitoring, so mm -hmm. we come to develop a digital elevation model from that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, after that, can we identify the areas prone to this failure, and uh, if the area is uh, this uh, heavily jointed, we will use a discontinuum model. Mm. So you said the numeric AMTT algorithm is applicable for predicting. Can uh, be it included in a discontinuum mock software like a three deck, or we can do it, uh, or it is uh, like a machine learning software. I am. Just no, no, it. no, it's much more simple than that. I'm afraid it cannot be implemented if you use something like 3 deck because it's not really meant to be used like that. So it basically it is a simple script which computes the simple geometrical rules required by the Markland tests, which usually you are supposed to, uh, to perform the Markland test using stereographic projections. So what the algorithm does is simply to perform uh, those tests without using a stereographic projection. 
and uh, employing the digital elevation model or digital surface model of the rock face. Um, so if to answer your question, no, you are not supposed to use it when using other more um, complex softwares. Um, so I, no, yes, yes, the answer in this case is no. And sir, one more question, sir, uh, what language it can be written and what are the input parameters if we take, uh, like in story of uh, stereograph, we will take deep direction and uh, strike of a length. So, so other than yeah, please height, continue. Sorry, if we take a height of a slope uh, or uh, means a stretch of uh, how much we are on this slope. Uh. Mm. So uh, remember that with this algorithm, we are simply computing the kinematic analysis. So you uh, are not supposed to compute in the calculations the um, stability side of rock mass stability analysis. So you're simply performing a geometrical check if that type of movement, if the types of movements are, uh, are possible. Uh, so the input are uh, simply the deep and deep direction and friction angle of the join sets of the end join sets that you might have within the rock mass. The number is not important. Then you have to, uh, to um, extract from the DSM of the rock face the aspect and deep and slope angle, which are used by the software to compute for each cell um, the deep direction and deep, respectively, of the slope in that cell. And, and that's it, that's what it requires. So uh, the, regarding the language, it's written using MATLAB because that's the software that we use most commonly. We are trying to translate it in Python because it's much more common than MATLAB, especially for those working with mm, different softwares. The, the, the basic idea is that we ideally we want to implement it in GIS softwares and most of them are written in Python. So, but we haven't translated it yet. So um, for now, the language is MATLAB. Uh, uh, so the package is developed already. It's open source or we have- Yeah, yeah, write. of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you check the, uh, yeah, on the, on the presentation the, on the slide, can I, can you still share the, the screen for a minute? Yeah, if you want to share, it's okay. Thank you. Let me get the slide, this one here. So if you see here, if you go to this uh, link here, I can copy paste it in the chat if you want. So if you do, if you go to this uh, link here, you, it's the GitHub page of this, of the algorithm, which is freely available and free, free access, of course. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, any other question? No, I rem if not, I remind you that the, this uh, seminar is uh, broadcasted on, uh, on YouTube. So if you want to see again the, the, all the presentation, you can go to the ISRM Young Member channels and, and do that. So if there are no more questions, we have time, but... Okay, so we can move to... The next uh, speaker. Thank you, uh, Battista, again for your presentation. Uh, next speaker that is not Lucille, but it's Jose. Okay, welcome, Jose. Uh, Jose Gregorio Gutierrez Chacon, who is currently an assistant professor at uh, ETSI, the Camino Canales y Puerto of the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid holding a master on soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering and on applied mathematics to engineering. Also, he holds bachelor in civil engineering and geological engineering, and he completed his PhD in engineering structure, foundation and material at the UPM in July 2020 with the highest academic score and cum laude distinction. The key achievement of his PhD work were developing uh, innovative numerical modeling and centrifugal testi testing to quantify the socket roughness effect of an increasing capacity of rock socket piles 
and the proposal of new guideline in this foundation from practitioner to do a more efficient design of RFPS. This PhD thesis was awarded at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, uh, extraordinary doctoral thesis award 2021, and the best doctoral thesis award in 2020 in geotechnical engineering by the Fundación José Entre Canales y Barres. Currently at UPM, Dr. Gutierrez is focused on geotechnical engineering with a special interest in developing advanced numerical models as well as in conducting field and laboratory tests. So far, Jose generated excellent publication, including high quality peer review journal with an international network of collaboration. So today we're presenting a talk entitled The Distinct Element Method Application in Rock Engineering Project. Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you, Federico, for your kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if you can see my presentation. Yes, perfectly. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, hi everyone. First of all, I would like to thank to the International Society for Rock Mechanics and Rock Engineering for the invitation to this seminar, as well as to the organizer. I'm happy to, to be here. And today I'm going to talk about the distinct element method application in rock engineering project. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on simulation of laboratory tests. And, and also I will talk about um, the response of actually loaded rock socketed piles. I have divided my presentation into these four sections. Uh, I will start with the background where I will show you the main aspects of the EM approach and the main aspect of rock socketed piles. Uh, next, I will move on to the small scale tests. Then I will present the methodology to simulate full scale tests. And finally, I will close the chat, this seminar with some concluding remarks. So let's move on to the background. There are several numerical codes that can be used in rock engineering problems that will depend on the problem that we have to analyze. But today I'm going to focus on the distinct element method and its implementation into particle flow code, PFC. So let's talk about the main aspect. What is the distinct element method? Uh, it's a powerful numerical solution initially developed to analyze the micro and macro mechanical behavior of rock. But later its application has been extended to study the response of soils as well as other materials. So as you can see on the left side, this type of technique discretized the domain by using particles. The geometry of these particles with the pen of the code that we used in the problem. But the most important thing is that the, the solution scheme is based on the application of the Newton second law at the contact. Um, sorry, at the particles, and the fourth displacement load at the contents, which will depend on the contact model use, which could be linear elastic load, frictional bounded model, or user-defined model, and so on. At each particle interaction, uh, the interaction will occur through forces and moments, which will depend on if which will depend on the contact model use in the numerical simulation. Now, what, what are rock socketed piles? Rock socketed piles are foundation elements that usually are employed to receive large and concentrated loads from superstructure and transmit them to deeper and stronger materials like rocks. The design of this type of element is based on the assumption that the load could be transmitted to the materials by the combination of the shaft resistant and the base resistant, or maybe only by base resistant or by shaft resistant. 
the key aspect here is that the shaft resistance is fully mobilized first at low well strain, which is usually around 1% of the pi head settlements. So this type of problem is usually analyzed by using a small scale test like laboratory tests through direct shear tests and considering constant normal stiffness boundary condition. Also, it could be analyzed by using centrifuge facilities. Another option is to study this behavior or the behavior of socketed piles through full scale load tests. However, it has more complication and we have to spend money or the setup is more complicated to do that. So as a result of this type of full scale test or a small scale test, the estimation of the shaft resistance of rock socketed pile is based on recommendation from codes and standards uh, by using local knowledge and Mainly the equation that usually is employed to estimate the shaft resistance of rock socketed piles is, using, is by using this equation, which is, who is function of the uniaxial compression strength of the rock. The main problem of this equation is that it doesn't consider additional factors that could affect the shaft resistance response, like the initial normal strength applied at the rock pile interface, uh, the length and the diameter of the pile, the construction method and the drilling tool and the drilling tools used, as well as the type and quality of the rock max, and the most important factor, which is the roughness at the pile rock interface. So in this lecture, I'm going to focus on the shaft resistance of rock socketed piles and considering the influence of the roughness at the pile rock interface. This is based on previous work that have demonstrated that this is a factor that could affect in, in a great way the response of, of the shaft resistance of socketed piles. As you can see here on the left side, uh, this author has demonstrated that, for example, the rougher pile, which is A3, have mobilized 1.5 more shaft resistance than this. this smooth pile A2. On the right side, we can see a similar behavior. As you can see, uh, the pile with RF equal to 0 0.1 have mobilized around 1.8 low capacity than the pile with RF 0 0.03C. This type of smoothness factor was proposed by this author and is usually commonly employed to denote the roughness at the pile rock interface. So the objective of this research is to analyze the behavior of actually loaded rock socketed pies through the distinct element method approach. To do that, we had focused at the beginning to study this behavior through laboratory tests, in particular through direct shear tests conducted in PFC code. To do that, we have considered this two scheme, direct shear test conducted on CNL boundary condition or considering CNS boundary condition. And also we have used these two type of contact model that can be selected in PFC code, the flat join contact model to simulate the macro response of the ATAC material like concrete or rock and the smooth joint content model to simulate the behavior at the interface of the concrete and rock. So to do that, we need to calibrate the input micro properties of each content model and the calibration process can be summarized in this flow chart. So usually the flat joint content model employed for the intact material like concrete or rock uh, the input parameter of this contact model is calibrated as an iterated process using the uniaxial compressing strength test. So if, if the then tests match the laboratory macro properties like the peak uniaxial strength, the young modulus and the poison rattle, we can move on to the next step and calibrate the smooth joint. Otherwise we have to modify 
the input parameters and conducting again the uniaxial compressing uh, strength test. The smooth join contact model is usually calibrated by using di uh, the EM direct shear test under constant normal load, considering unbounded planar concrete and rod interfaces. So we have to conduct maybe a couple of the EM tests and check if the numerical simulation reproduce well the peak shear stress and the corresponding peak shear displacement. When we, when we have complete all this flowchart, we can be sure that the, all the micro properties have been calibrated. So more detail about this iterative process can be found in this paper. So if you have any question, uh, you can also contact me by email. I would like to show you some results after conducting this process. Here I show you the comparison between the macromechanical property properties obtained with the laboratory test and the DM test. So as you can see here, uh, the numerical results are in a good agreement with the value obtained in the laboratory test. Also, you can conduct a more detailed analysis and see what type of microcrafts are generated to, during the numerical simulation. And here I show you the result after conducting the calibration of the smooth joint content model. And as you can see here, the laboratory and the DEM result are quite similar. So we can, we can be sure that the smooth UN content model has been calibrated. So the main aspect here is that after the calibration process has been complete, have been completed, we can use now these macro properties as a predictive tool, as, as a predictive tool to estimate the shear stress response of other type of direct shear test, considering different geometry at the concrete rock interface, and also considering CNL boundary condition or even CNS boundary condition. So let's see what happens if we use the micro properties calibrated before to estimate the shear stress uh, response on concrete saxton interface under CNL boundary condition. So as you can see here, the DEM numerical model agree well with the peak shear stress and the corresponding peak shear displacement obtained in this laboratory test. And also we can measure the type of microcraft that will generate during the numerical simulation. And this behavior is also similar if we conduct this type of simulation considering direct CR test with CNS boundary conditions. So this is a powerful tool that can be used to conduct a more detailed analysis of the shear stress, considering different type of rock concrete materials, considering different type of uh, geometry at the, at the rock concrete interface. And also we can conduct a more detailed analysis to see what type of Shear, what type of microcraft shear tension microcraft control the failure mechanism at the concrete and road interface. So the next step was that we conducted was to analyze or to extend this methodology to see what happened in the shaft resistant response of actually road socketed piles. Um, here I show you an idealized subsurface profile of a rock socketed piles. And on the right side of the slide, the corresponding 3D DEM model developed to represent this model. So as you can see, um, all details to generate this DDM sample can be found in this paper. But the main aspect is that only a 40 degree angle portion of the pile was considered. Uh, we have applied pressure lobe on top of the rock to simulate the self wave of the pile and the overlying soil stratum. And the void base was made without particles because only shaft resistance is considered the rain. So let's move on and see what happened. Uh, oh, also, I would like to mention that because we are analyzing the effect of soccer roughness, different roughness profile has been considered at the pile rock interface with this sinusoidal pattern because 
this is the typical profile that we could obtain if we use this type if we use this type of drilling tomb during the construction of the rock socket piles. Also, as you can see, the, the EM model has has been denoted with this RF factor, which has been proposed by this actor because it's easily to estimate all the geometry parameters of this uh, geometry. So let's see the result. Here I show you the response of the average shaft resistance obtained with the numerical model against the um, socket head settlement or the normalized pile settlement by the pile diameter. So as you can see, the roughness factor is a crucial factor uh, that could affect the low capacity of the rock socketed pile. For instance, you can see the pile with an, uh, an IRF of 0 0.025 is two times higher than that shaft system of a life by the pipe with 0 0.010. So is this results support the idea that the roughness is a crucial factor that affect the behavior of the road socketed pile. Also this type of DEM models can be used to check what is the type of failure mechanism that occurs at the pile rock interface. And as you can see here in the upper part, I show you the model in which the rock is weaker than the concrete pile. In the lower part, the rock is stronger than the concrete pile. So as you can see, the failure mechanism is, is different, depends on the strength of the rock. And also we can see what type of craft shear or tensile craft uh, control the failure mechanism at the pile rock interface. Also, the results that we obtain with the numerical model have been compared with some curve proposed by other authors to estimate the shaft resistance of rock socketed piles. So as you can see on the left side, on, on the right side, the numerical models agree, agree well with the overall trend of the suggested Kubert for all uh, for both research worlds. So the numerical model develops a develop a rain and reproduce well the response of other suggested work published in the later two. So we have used these results to propose a new curve to estimate the average shaft resistance of rock socketed piles as a function of the roughness factor, the new axial compresses F trend of the weaker material concrete pile, and for a pile head settlement of 1% of the pile diameter. So with this formulation, we are trying to estimate in a better way or in a better way, considering additional factor than only the new axial compressive strength, the average shaft resistance of rock socketed piles. So as a concluding remark, I would like to say that the EM models developed here, here can be used as a predictive tool to analyze the shear strength response of concrete rock interface, even considering CNL and CNS boundary condition, and also considering different geometry at the, at the concrete rock interface. Also, the DM models developed here can be employed to estimate the shaft resistance of socketed piles, and result of this work has been employed to have been employed to propose a factor to estimate the, the shaft resistance. Before finish this lecture, uh, let me show you briefly additional application of the EN approach. So also we can employ this technique to conduct a more in-depth analysis of the lower transfer behavior of socketed pile, like I show you here. And we can analyze what type of axial stress and shaft resistance distribution we could have uh, along the pile rock interface and also in the pile. Also, this type of technique can be employed to analyze the rock creep in the tunnels. And as you can see on the right side, this type of DEM model uh, reproduce well the typical behavior of rock creep, respond like primary creep, secondary creep, and tertiary creep and failure.
Finally, we have also used this type of technique to analyze the rock creep in laboratory tests like direct shear tests conducted um, considering creep condition. And finally, I would like to thanks to the team members that have worked with me to develop all of this work. And I would like to thanks to this institution to support our research progress, our research works. Thank you for your attention. And if you have uh, any question, I will be happy to clarify it, or please feel free to contact me at this email. Thank you, Jose, again, for this very interesting application of uh, distinct element model to the, the study of uh, deep foundation. So we are again perfectly on time. So we have time now for, we can open the question and answer discussion for 10 minutes. So if anyone has any question for, for, for Jose, the, the floor is yours. I have one question, Jose. Sure. Um, or oh, it's more like a comment, because I think it can be very interesting to apply it also to fault mechanics. I don't know if you have thought about this. You have the same issues like grain breakage, friction. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. That currently, also, we are analyzing the stability of rock slope. So. Mm. Uh, I mean, with this type of technique, we have to to be clear that I mean the safe factor is not easily to, to, or can be easily estimated. So, but it's a powerful technique that we can be applied to failure process like this type of the dimension. And how about computational performance? Do you have any yes limitations there? Yes, sure. I, I'll also maybe that's a good question that maybe could be emerge at this topic. And I have some slide that I can share because <laughs> time limitation. But let me share another, and I will talk about a little bit more about this aspect. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Let me let me open another an, another a background presentation for this type of questions that. They always come, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Wait a minute. Please let me know if you can see my screen now. Yes. Yes. One of the questions that could emerge is if we have to, if it's possible to conduct the calibration using 2D or 3D models, no? Here I show you the result of this type of process. As you can see, the 3D result are quite similar to the 2D result. But the main question is, or the main problem is the number of particles that we can use 2D modeled. We have used around 1,000 particles, but with 3D models, we have multiplied by 23, I think. So the, it means that we have to employ more time and the computational time will be bigger. No? As you can see here, the result, I, the result are quite similar, but the main suspect is the time. As you can see to the model is around 1.5 minutes, but 3D calibration is around two hours. So mm -hmm. depends of the geometry of the problem, uh, we have more or more time, more particles. So it's a good question. So, uh, we have to try to, to optimize the geometry of the problem to minimize this type of problem. But also this type of question emerges if we conduct 3D direct shear tests. So the results are quite similar, even considering 3D boundary, periodic boundary condition. But here I show you the type of the time that we sh that could be played to, to conduct this type of model. 2D, 2D DM model around two hours. 3D DM model with PVC condition, almost 19 hours, but 3D DM model with, with this simple geometry is around 50 hours. So 
the bigger is the problem, the bigger the most number of particles we will use, and also we more we will employ more time to conduct this type of numerical simulation. Yeah, thanks. Welcome. Any other question? Hey, I have a one one more question. It's about also about the scale. Have you considered in some manner the effect of or possible potential effect of uh, the the roughness of different scales and also the diameter of the pile? I imagine yeah. that yes, but uh, yes, by it's, it's, following this the, the, the last question. Yes, it's, it's a good question. In fact, when I show you the first slide. Uh, wait a minute again. As I say before, the low capacity of the road socket piles depends on the length and the diameter of the pile. So with the DM model, uh, we, we didn't, but is, this aspect has been analyzed in other centrifuge test that I have performed during my PhD. And we have analyzed the effect of the by length. So it, of course, it'll affect the, the response. So it's an aspect that we, we could analyze with the model, but I'm pretty sure that will, it's, it's, it's a great factor that could affect also the behavior of the low capacity. Okay, thanks and congratulations for your excellent ah, yes. work. I, I forgot to, to answer the other question, which is the effect of the geometry, I think, Ignacio. Yes, it, it will affect as well because in practical, the roughness at the pile rock interface depends on, I show you here in the screen, depends on the type of quality of the rock depend also on the drilling tool tubes and also depend on, on the, if we use a standard tools or if we use additional tools to increase, to increase the roughness resultant after the construction of the, of the pile. So yes, of course, it, it will affect also the failure mechanism during the loading test. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have another screen. I'm, I'm, I'm well here. Uh, thank you very much for your for your answer and congratulations for the presentation and for your excellent work to you and to all of your team in Madrid. Okay, you're welcome. So Ignacio, I think I can follow with the... Okay, I'll share the screen I'll again. Share the screen. Yeah. Yeah, so everyone at this at this point, I would have been excited to introduce the next presenter, which was supposed to be uh, Lucille Cabillet, but I have some bad news. Unfortunately, she told me that she would like to be excused due to some unforeseen circumstances. So she will not be able to present here, unfortunately, now. Um, so of course, we regret that you will all not be able to hear her presentation. And uh, therefore, we already have to close this, this today's seminar, which was the 12th in this uh, session, in the 12th session in the series of, of young member seminars. And of course, I would like, on the behalf of the organizing committee, to thank the IASERM for helping us with the organization and the logistics of this event. And I would like to again thank to all the speakers. So Mr. Taboni, Dr. Cuites Cachon, and uh, Lucille, who couldn't be there, unfortunately, um, for the very interesting and valu val valuable presentations. So we heard about uh, two quite different topics but all related to rock mechanics and rock engineering. And um, we hope 
on behalf of the organizing committee that the seminar still provides you with new insights and challenges for your research. And we really like to continue this periodic event for sharing our ideas about rock mechanics and related topics. So for this reason, we want to invite you also for the next upcoming seminar that will be held virtually in the same uh, framework as we did today. Um, we didn't, we don't have a date already, but we will inform you in the coming weeks through our uh, social network pages of the ISRM, uh, through the website or the LinkedIn uh, pages, as you have already seen. So please keep in touch uh, through these channels to be informed when the next seminar will be held. And also, of course, if you are interested in participating or to present by yourself, you can contact us through the, the email address that we show here, or also contact your local groups to, to ask them for uh, being nominated for the for presentation. So with that, I want to thank you all again, the presenters, the audience for having attended this exciting seminar, and I hope you have a wonderful day or wonderful evening wherever you are right now. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you all. See you in one month in Salzburg, who will attend the ISRM symposium. Mm. Yes. Yes. You can see. I will be there. Live. In presence, not only. <laughs> Yeah. See you then. Much better. Okay, Goodbye. thank you very much. Okay, Have thank nice. you all. Thank guys. you very much. Bye.